Okay, morning everyone. Um, hope everyone survived uh, last night. Um, I, uh, <coughs> I wasn't too bad. Uh, I got my nice uh, shirt from, uh, from ShakaCon, looking beautiful blue. Um, so, today um, I'm going to talk about um, what I've dubbed the Wi-Fi based MC catcher. Um, for those of you who don't know some of the acronyms, I'll be going through some of them, but the MC is the International Mobile Subscriber Identifier. That's the thing that's inside everyone's SIM card, uniquely identifies you and, you and your subscribe, subscription to a mobile carrier. And I've come up with some ways to track this on Wi-Fi, believe it or not. I've given this talk um, before, just to sort of let you know. Um, uh, my co-worker, um, Ravi, couldn't be here today, sadly. Um, but uh, he, um, he came along when we first gave the talk a black hat. Um, so we got a bit of press coverage there, Register, Intercept, Hacker News, and about 20 others. But, um, so you may have read about it before. So just... Um, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about um, what an MC is, break it down a bit, um, then talk about what a conventional MC catches. Things have been around for a while, things like um, Stingray and, uh, and various others. Um, and then we'll uh, dig into um, what, what makes the uh, Wi-Fi based MC catcher. Basically comes down to two um, sort of techniques uh, through which um, current smartphones actually connect into the mobile network um, or communicate with the mobile network um, core infrastructure at uh, some level. Uh, unfortunately, um, there are some issues with that, which mean that you can create a Wi-Fi based MC catcher. Then um, I talk about uh, operator, vendor, and um, mobile OS um, mitigations and then some sort of suggestions about user mitigations. So, um, what is an MC? As I said, it stands for International Mobile Subscriber Identity. It's basically a globally unique identifier, um, which uh, is typically about 15 digits. Kind of breaks down, you've got the first three digits as a country code. Um, they're not like the uh, Telephone country code, sadly, 234 is for UK, which normal telephone number um, prefix is 44, but there we are, it's just, um, there's a bunch of these different kind of numbers for countries. Um, and then you've got the mobile network number, um, in this case 12, um, actually refers to, um, I think it's Vodafone, but it uh, could be any, any other one. Um, and then uh, the last, uh, last set of digits is the mobile subscriber identity number, that's the unique bit that sort of identifies your subscription. Um, <clears throat> basically, it allows for authentication of a device to the network or mutual authentication, depending on which generation of um, mobile pro protocols you're talking about. So um, 2G or, or GSM only uses the, um, it, it uses the, uh, the MC as the sort of like uh, user identifier part and then you have um, as part of the authentication process you have what's called a secret key which is um, it's a symmetric key it's stored inside the uh, the SIM card um, and uh, it's not um, directly accessible but it's basically used in part of the cryptographic exchanges that um, authenticate the device onto the network um, then in 3 and 4G, um, they, uh, you, use, you also use the secret authentication key, um, but then, you all, then there's a second um, piece of information called the uh, sequence number, which is stored inside the SIM card and is updated every time an authentication um, occurs. So that prevents some um, replay attacks on the authentication. So. Basically, 3 and 4G have improved um, the, the authentication process fairly significantly because also, also they um, introduce the mutual um, authentication of the device to the network and the network to the device. So um, the actual um, MC itself is, uh, is stored in 
two places. So it's it's in the SIM card itself, um, or well, the SIM card. It's officially known as a UICC, um, and the actual SIM bit is 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 now actually a um, what's called a sort of SIM app, um, and it's technically known as the USIM um, in uh, three and three and four G. Um, and this MC is basically directly readable from the uh, from the SIM card itself. So that little uh, that little kind of blue piece of plastic there, you can um, buy those off off eBay for a couple of dollars, pop it into your your laptop or desktop, and you can read off information from the SIM itself. I wrote a little blog post about it uh, about a year or so ago when I was poking around at this stuff. Um, you can also pay a lot more for a SIM reader with um, sort of various other capabilities. But um, at the end of the day, there's a bunch of uh, files, EFs as they're called, um, on the SIM card. And um, they contain various readable and potentially writable um, sections. But the, as I say, the MC itself is just um, a readable, not modifiable uh, entity on the SIM card. And the actual secret key um, and sequence number in the case of uh, 3, 4G, not actually directly accessible. What happens is you can call certain functions which then carry out operations on the key, uh, which are then provided back to you so that they can then be used to perform the authentication. And then, of course, the, uh, the MC has got to be stored in the operator. So it's actually it's stored inside the operator's database, which is, goes under various names like the HSS, Home Subscriber Server, or, the, or um, in the older terminology, the AUC. Um, and so the operator obviously has that big database, so they can then do the authentication between the device, wherever it is on the network, and the uh, home server. And there's a little bit of uh, additional complexity in there. There are, there are things called authentication vectors that can be shared from the operator network and then pushed out to various edge points on the network and used to authenticate devices. Anyway, we won't go into too much detail about that. Um, but basically, in terms of uh, this presentation, the, the last sort of bullet point is, um, is of interest because the MC has been known as, a, as a, an identifier that allows for tracking of, of devices, essentially, um, or potentially tracking of individuals, because the MC is tied directly to the SIM card. So if you take it out of one device, put it into another, you can still track that same unique MC. There are, of course, other uh, identifiers that are associated typically with the device itself, like um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC hardware addresses, ex like the MAC address, the things like the, the MAC address on, on Wi-Fi um, have seen some improvements in terms of privacy. Um, if you've been following the area, that the uh, since the release of uh, iOS 8 on um, Apple devices, they've introduced what's called um, MAC randomization. So they actually randomize the, uh, the Wi-Fi MAC address uh, at certain points when the device is connecting to the network. It's typically on, on um, iOS devices, the MAC is randomized when the device is just scanning for um, available networks. So that has traditionally has been used and abused for tracking as well, but it makes it a little bit harder to uh, track the devices because when your phone's sitting in your pocket there uh, and you've got Wi-Fi flipped on, it's constantly doing um, Wi-Fi probes. But as I say, since iOS 8 in, in the sort of newer devices, it does do randomized Mac, but then it actually drops back to your uh, hardware Mac when you connect to a network. So you can still be tracked there. Uh, anyway, similar kind of things. Um, Bluetooth is actually, um, in the later versions of Bluetooth, Bluetooth 4 uh, introduced some uh, enhanced privacy mechanisms there around the actual um, MAC addresses, uh, which, was, which was nice to see. Um, and then you've got other device identifiers like the IMEI, the uh, International Mobile Equipment Identifier. Now that's the actual 
the unique um, a sort of device identifier for the actual mobile phone itself. And that, that can't be changed. And that is exchanged in some of the mobile um, protocols. And that uniquely just identifies that device. So if you pull the, the SIM card out of it, it still has the same IMEI. And then you've got others like the MSISDN, which is a technical name for the phone number. Um, that is um, not really actually sort of stored um, directly in, in, the, in the SIM card or um, potentially in the phone. It, it, it sort of, there's a mapping that's established by the operator. So it's not so easy to uh, obtain the phone number directly from the phone, strangely enough. Um, over some of these protocols, they basically use the MC to uh, to then map into your phone number because then that gives you sort of flexibility. You can change your SIM and then you keep the same number, things like that. So there's not sort of tied in at the low level. So anyway, better move on. Conventional uh, MC catchers. So so you got so the MC is then, as I say, used in um, in a sort of three. 4G authentication. So typically, you got the sort of features. So you got you can you can do tracking of the MC. Um, you can potentially also track the IMEI, the um, device identifier, which then basically allows you to kind of potentially identify the location of the device um, and when it's active. And with um, a number of the conventional MC catches, you can also do call interception, SMS data interception. Um, but these kind of devices, they have to operate in the licensed mobile bands. Um, so whatever it is, GSM, 3G, 4G. And operating in those kind of bands is uh, not something you do lightly, because uh, guys like the FCC or, uh, or others would kind of come down on you pretty hard if you start to, um, if you spin up a, a base station on, on, um, in the 3, 4G mobile spectrum. Um, you're not going to be around for too long doing that kind of thing, unless you're law enforcement or you're a heavy-duty uh, bad guy. Um, so, but basically, uh, they've become more and more prevalent. They've been being used by sort of law enforcement and other agencies for kind of quick tracking jobs, and they operate. Basically, they um, they operate by pretending to be a base station, a fake base station, to lure in local mobile phones to connect to them because they they basically artificially raise the power of the uh, of the base station so that devices will preferentially attach to them and then they then do various there are various techniques for um, getting the phone to attach and then potentially downgrading the um, authentication used or exploiting some of the flaws in some of the um, protocol exchanges, there are also some kind of test mode commands that are available on some um, access points and base stations and things that have slowly been kind of shut down um, in terms of the uh, those, those, those kind of attacks. But it's still possible to, to use um, MC catchers on, on quite a lot of phones and it's actually pretty difficult to, to stop these devices. And I mean, typically there was things like the Stingray around for a while, but um, but now you can uh, you can go to Alibaba and buy one for a couple of thousand dollars, um, or you can even make yourself one up because um, just using a laptop and uh, one of these SDR boards, a software-defined radio boards that has um, there's a bunch of them out there. There's a sort of high-end um, kind of devices. Basically, an SDR board is just a it gives you it's got a, um, some kind of analog tuner um, and, uh, and then a fast uh, analog digital converter. And potentially, well, you, you need to sort of send and receive to do this um, in both directions. And so there's a whole raft of uh, software defined radio kind of kit out there now. Um, you, can even, you can even sort of passively listen in on, on um, a, a number of uh, sort of mobile frequencies just using the, 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 the most simple, cheapest uh, SDR device called the RTL-SDR, which is like a 15-buck 
uh, USB dongle, and um, and it's it's been very popular for basically allows you to kind of look at a fairly good sized chunk of the spectrum from about 24 megahertz up to um, nearly like nearly two gig. So uh, there's a bunch of uh, mobile sort of frequencies in there, but then depends on your country. Not necessarily recommended if you're uh, in certain jurisdictions. I mean, you're not really supposed to listen in on on uh, encrypted communications in a in a bunch of countries. Although some of the some of the communication, there's a bunch of communication that's not actually encrypted, but still, anyway, it can be a bit of a gray area. Um, anyway, those kind of things have been around for quite a while since the early 90s. Um, so as I say, some of the techniques, well, they 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 basically they can either the sort of simplest um, approach is to downgrade the phones to 2G, because there's a bunch of um, problems with 2G. Um, although the thing is, 2G is still pretty prevalent in a lot of countries. I guess in the U.S., 2G didn't kind of take such a foothold, but in a lot of um, Europe and uh, chunks of Asia, um, still a lot of 2G out there. Um, then 4G and 3G, the exploits are a little bit uh, more complicated, um, but still, still possible. Um, and there are sort of some newer techniques coming along. In fact, my colleague um, Ravi Shankar, hit, that's more of his area um, around um, some of the um, techniques in, in 3 and 4G MC catching. So um, protection against MC catch as well. Um, there are there are actually some um, apps out there, believe it or not. Um, couple couple I just mentioned, Snoop Stitch, which is one that's developed out some labs in Germany, and uh, that that basically sort of turns the phone into a into a sort of monitor of of uh, the access points or the base stations, and then you can work out whether you're seeing some strange um, base stations pop up in places that they weren't before. And Darshak is another tool that one just um, looks for um, strange um, settings when you connect to the network, like um, with some mobile networks aren't really configured well or something. You can, you can basically, if you, you spin up a base station, you can just say, don't use encryption. Sadly, some, some devices uh, will um, do that. Um, and I guess the thing is, is with the mobile um, standards, is that they have to be, they're put together by international outfits and, um, well, collaboration of many countries, and some countries have more restrictive practices than others, so some countries say, well, we want to be able to switch off encryption. And so that's that kind of, you have to get the full spectrum support. Um, so unfortunately, some of these some of these functionalities can be enabled. But uh, anyway, so there's not really much protection for um, sort of commercially commercial ones. But sorry, I actually mentioned there's another service ba survey based one called SeaGlass from uh, University of Washington. That's basically a kind of drive around thing. They had like a um, Raspberry Pi with uh, with a sort of bait phone attached, and they drove up and down. Um, and they could have monitored the uh, whole area uh, for the current base station sort of patterns, frequencies, and then they then sort of regularly monitor it and then watch for anomalies in the uh, in the patterns of uh, radio use and and transmission, particularly. So sort of you can spot like um, bogus base stations popping up. Um, and then, so as I say, like normal devices, not much protection, but there are special phones, like the Black Phone and a couple of others that are pretty expensive. Um, they, had some, they provide some protection. They can potentially flag you up when there's um, encryption downgrade attacks and things. Other solutions, well, turn off cellular. Okay, then the phone doesn't work. Use Wi-Fi. Sadly, we're going to find out that's got its own problems. So on to the uh, main bit of the talk. So with the Wi-Fi based MC catcher, um, you basically, you can extract the MC and um, essentially locate the device. There's no interception at this, at this stage. Um, it's just purely um, obtaining the MC. 
but it operates in the unlicensed band, um, the ISM um, bands, the industrial scientific medical bands. Um, so things like 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, which is what most um, Wi-Fi operates on them. And there's a bunch of others, depending on which countries you're at. Um, and has a range of a few hundred meters, but that can be extended to, well, significantly longer than that, depending on uh, how many Pringle cans you strap together or uh, how much you crank up the, uh, the power output. Officially, you're not really supposed to crank up the power out beyond a certain point with, uh, with Wi-Fi and the ISM bands. That's the kind of only limitation about using those things. But basically how it operates is you can spin up a fake, fake access point and then that um, provides you with uh, a way of, um, well, capturing the MC in, 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 in one situation or two techniques that I'm going to talk about. Um, and then also redirecting traffic to uh, a bogus uh, gateway. And then there are also, um, well, they're basically down to these configuration issues that I'll talk about in a minute. So basically based upon these two techniques that I mentioned at the beginning, um, Wi-Fi network authentication, which is officially in the, uh, in the standards, uh, this is, these are sort of standardized by the 3GPP, um, the sort of main mobile standards body, and it's a particular document, TS33234. Um, and it's got this, uh, it, it defines a bunch of stuff, but the, the two key things are um, this Waveland direct IP access, which it's not very catchy, but basically this, it's, uh, I, I've called it Wi-Fi network authentication, but basically what that is is, um, Operators are now providing um, their own Wi-Fi access points. Often they're kind of virtual um, access points. So you see them in public places, um, like for example in um, in the London Underground. That's where I first encountered it. In fact, um, this is I was just sat on the phone, fiddling with my phone on the uh, the London Underground in the subway, and. Uh, Slightly, slightly bored, just sat there and uh, looked at my phone, sort of flipped it on and uh, looked at all the Wi-Fi networks and then realized, shoot, my phone is connected to uh, this network. I, I, I never tapped on that network, I never typed in a password and it's securely attached to that network. I thought, what's going on here? Um, so it basically, um, there's, a, there's a way that I'm going to go into in a second, uh, how the phone actually automatically authenticates onto these networks, which are run by the operator. So the second bit is, um, is when the phone uses Wi-Fi calling, which um, some of the, well, that's actually been around for a little while, but uh, basically um, it allows for you to make calls over Wi-Fi and typically it's integrated into the OS so that when you hit the little phone kind of uh, app, the standard phone app on, on, the phone, on the device, not some extra kind of over the top sort of app like Skype or something, just the actual normal phone app, type in a number, dial it, it'll just go over Wi-Fi instead when, um, when that kind of service is enabled. So anyway, uh, it runs over Wi-Fi so you can basically set up one of these uh, catches on a anything with a Wi-Fi like from uh, probably a Raspberry Pi upwards. I run it on a, I run a proof of concept on, on here on the laptop just uh, in a VM connected to a USB dongle but um, I'm not quite going to have time to demo it because there's some little issues about uh, it when you're roaming. But anyway, the uh, mobile architecture, so this is a sort of brief overview of, of it. Um, so you've got the device or the um, user equipment is technically known as the uh, in the 3GPP specs, and so you've got the two the two points. So just to give you a sort of graphical representation, the uh, the blue dotted line shows you the Waveland direct IP access or the um, Wi-Fi network authentication. So that just goes to the AP, and then you've got the red one, and that goes into the network. So that doesn't necessarily have to go through some kind of operator sponsored uh, Wi-Fi access point. It just goes. Um, it can go through any kind of Wi-Fi connection, and it connects to a special device called an edge packet data gateway, which is 
essentially connected into the core of the network. So Wi-Fi network attachment. Um, so you've got the normal kind of, uh, there's a bunch of ways of connecting. So typically you've got the unencrypted access points, um, maybe with a captive portal in there. Um, then you've got your sort of what you might call normal encrypted Wi-Fi access points. We've got a pre-shared password or credentials, tap in the password when it, when it pops up. And then you've got these auto-connect type um, access points. And uh, typically what they use is they use this protocol called 802.1x. Um, and the, uh, the Wi-Fi key is negotiated without any user intervention. And in our case, it turns out that the, that the SIM card is actually used to provide this, um, these credentials. And uh, they allow for the authentication to happen in, um, automatically. And this uh, process is controlled by operator provider configuration. Now, on a bunch of phones, it's um, automatic. It's pre-installed um, on most um, Apple phones and quite a lot of Android phones now. Then there are also manual options for configuring this as well. So if we look into the automatic configuration, as I say, some, some Windows and Android phones automatically connect. So when you stick the SIM card in your phone and then it automatically selects a, um, a profile inside the phone and sets up um, which operator sponsored Wi-Fi networks to connect to, like sort of AT&T Wi-Fi or Vodafone Wi-Fi. So yeah, with, as I say, with I looked uh, probably in more depth at iOS, um, you, you stick the SIM card in, then it automatically brings up this specific mobile config file and um, it, can, it configures a bunch of options, but basically the ones of interest are a bunch of Wi-Fi SSIDs listed in this um, that, that basically say connect using um, this 802.1x. We did, I did a brief analysis of uh, iOS 9 profiles, and um, there's more than 60 profiles um, across 44 countries supporting um, this, this way of connecting to the network. And um, it constitutes like um, 66 unique um, SSIDs that the phone, um, well, a phone maybe, it was not going to be connected to all those at the same time. That's the sort of potentially just one, one or two typically. So the upshoot of that is that the phone is continuously trying to silently, automatically authenticate to uh, these SSIDs, scanning the networks all the time, as they say, and then when it pops up and sees the one that it knows, it tries to authenticate. So manual configuration. Um, so you just basically, some of them, like some of the Android phones, Windows phones, you have to basically just kind of do some steps. You just follow it on the website. And uh, once you've sort of done that step initially, then boom, the phone just carries on automatically connecting. There's a bunch of other sort of carrier control mechanisms under Android coming out. Some of the um, versions of uh, Android have some different support there. I didn't really dig into that too much, but in theory, I think they can, they can provide that. So looking um, at the automatic Wi-Fi authentication, you've got um, this 802.1x, um, which is um, standardized by the uh, IEEE, and um, it, uh, it basically uses a, an authentication protocol called EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol, specified by the, um, the IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, guys who standardize HTTP, FTP, that kind of stuff, um, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, in fact, like modern mobile networks are basically IP networks. So, uh, and it's kind of basically known as EPOL, EAP, over LAN or over Wi-Fi. And there are two specific um, e methods um, that we're interested in. EAP SIM, which um, basically uses uh, GSM type security, 2G security, currently the most widely used for, um, for this Wi-Fi network authentication. And um, EAP ACA, which is a 3G based um, security. So it uses the sequence number as well. So it's a bit more secure currently supported in um, basically uh, most of the smartphone platforms out there, iOS, Android, Windows Mobile, BlackBerry. I contacted um, all of those guys, and uh, they um, admitted that there was an issue here. Um, Apple were 
particularly interested in getting it sorted out. Um, sadly, because uh, it's sort of not entirely one person's problem or one company's problem, they're not interested in, there's no privacy boundaries out there. Um, but uh, this stuff is, is deployed in many countries, as I said, and it's, it's growing. So let's have a look at uh, what's happening inside this protocol. So you've got three basic identity types um, for authentication. You've got the permanent identifier, which is um, uh, what we're interested in, basically, the MC. That's typically used initially, and afterwards a temporary ID is used, um, which um, actually it's a, it's a third one down, the fast reauthentication identity which is a lower overhead for reattachment after initial exchange. So basically, um, it just means that you can do a quick setup with the um, AAA server in the, in the network where your phone just connects and then just gets this sort of temporary ID that it then uses to do a fast reconnect. Um, and then there's a third one, the pseudonym identity, which is basically um, a kind of a, it's basically a pseudonym for the MC and it can be um, supplied by the network. And um, that potentially provides some additional protection, but uh, sadly, um, that hasn't been implemented in, in most devices at the moment. However, it's something that has just um, begun to uh, see the light of day. In fact, as a result of um, my um, interactions with Apple, they basically um, have now added this functionality into iOS 10. Um, but going in to just explain how this sort of stuff works, um, so you've got these three types of identities. As I said, I connected the permanent and fast reauthentication. But then um, you've got this, what is called peer policy. So the liberal peer, um, there are two modes, liberal peer and conservative peer. Liberal peer is the sort of current default, and that basically will... Um, the phone, when it first connects, as I say, it, it, it uses the full um, identity, the MC, and, um, and then uses this fast reauthentication. But in the liberal mode, what happens is if, you, if an access point says, let's do full authentication, and um, in a liberal mode, it, and the phone just says, okay, sure. So it's basically like, give me your MC, and, and the phone just says, okay. Uh, and that's a liberal mode, that's the current default. Conservative peer mode is a future deployment option which they're um, hopefully should be rolling out fairly soon. Uh, that only responds to the question of the permanent identity, in other words the MC, when there's no pseudonym available. But you have to sort of basically introduce the uh, distribution infrastructure for the pseudonyms. So this is, you probably don't have to read everything, all you really need to know is the first two steps. You've got EAP request identity from the authenticator, that's basically the network, the peer is the mobile phone, and then the uh, EAP response identity, and that is, in the case of full authentication, is the MC. So it's just like one, two, bang, and you've got the, uh, you've got the MC. And the rest of it is then the actual authentication and key exchange you exchange the keys to actually encrypt the content. The actual then content is um, is not compromised. We don't uh, we haven't um, developed techniques to compromise the the keys, so content still safe. Um, but to say this, um, well, I haven't actually said it yet, but the unfortunately the e protocol is not encrypted and um, currently is not tunneled through an encrypted tunnel, uh, so. Uh, sadly, the MC is visible on first connect, just like a passive capture with a Wireshark in monitor mode. And it's also open to an active attack because most devices are running in this, um, this uh, liberal peer mode. So you can just say, give me your MC, and the phone says, sure. Um, and this problem is amplified by the fact that um, most smartphones out there are pre-configured with profiles to basically connect to certain SSIDs. And uh, as some of you know, sort of that you, get, you can just spin up an AP and pretend to be a whole bunch of uh, access points and you can just uh, probably get most phones to uh, connect and hand over the MC. 
So that's, that's uh, number one. And um, technique, number two technique, as I said, Wi-Fi calling. So what happens is the phone connects sort of a Wi-Fi, doesn't really matter how it's connected to Wi-Fi, um, can be any, any, any kind of technique. And then it connects to this um, entity in the uh, core of the network, I showed you like that diagram earlier. And um, it's called the Edge Packet Data Gateway. And basically, um, it connects, and when, when the phone has got like low signal, or you can actually just, if you put it into airplane mode, flip on the Wi-Fi, and you've got Wi-Fi calling enabled, and you're not roaming, because it seems that some uh, operators, or possibly Apple, I'm not exactly sure who's responsible, but they flip off Wi-Fi calling when you're roaming. But then it then connects to this device. It connects using IPSEC. So you'd have thought maybe that, that'd be good news. Um, well, it is kind of good news in that um, IPSEC is um, pretty much encrypted most of the uh, interactions. But as we'll see, unfortunately, the crucial one um, has a problem. Um, but this, again, is supported in iOS, Android, Windows. Um, and again, I reported it to uh, um, all, of the, uh, all of those concerned. So brief IPSEC overview. Um, IPSEC is a sort of protocol suite, really, it's a whole bunch of stuff. So you've got authentication with AH, authenticated header. Confidentiality is through uh, ESP, um, encapsulated security payload. And then you've got the key management, which is where we're interested in which is um, currently known as a Ike V2, um, Internet Key Exchange version 2. There's been a whole bunch of different ones, sort of Ike V1, and then back to things like Oakley. But these, again, were all specified in the uh, IETF. They've been working on this. It's a kind of complicated area. Um, and then there's a couple of modes of uh, operation of IMSEC, typically, typically. You've got tunnel mode, which is what we're using, or you've got transport mode, which is another one just for more direct connection. So. With uh, Ike v2, you've got uh, an, a connection in two phases. You've got the Ike SA init. That negotiates uh, cryptographic algorithms, nonces, and then it uses um, a Diffie-Hellman exchange to generate transient key for, um, for use to encrypt the Ike auth step, which is the next step. And in this step, um, you exchange identities, um, and in our case, it's the, uh, it's the MC and a bunch of other stuff. Now, um, and the Ike auth transports um, that other um, EAP protocol, the EAP ACA, as opposed to the EAP SIM, um, which, is, which is better news. EAP ACA is stronger. Um, but uh, Diffie-Hellman, as some of you may be aware, is... Um, is open to sort of man-in-the-middle attacks, the sort of default um, basic use of, uh, of Diffie-Hellman, unless you use a certificate to authenticate the uh, exchange. Unfortunately, um, as it stands, uh, there is no certificate used to authenticate the Diffie-Hellman exchange, so um, it's open to a man-in-the-middle attack on uh, identity. So you can basically spin up like a fake edge packet data gateway, run uh, IPSEC server on there and pretend to be the uh, endpoint, and you can extract the, uh, the MC that way. But uh, so you got the MC. But again, cool content, still safe. So you're good there. So that's, that's the two techniques. So what can you do about it? Um, well, first thing is probably good to get rid of is IPSIM, because it's based on um, 2G. Um, security, which isn't the greatest, uh, but it's still pretty prevalent. Uh, what I, I basically wrote a paper that was as part of a mobile security workshop at IEEE um, Security and Privacy um, last month in San Jose, and we, we talked about some, some attacks on, uh, on EAP-SIM as, as part of this work. So basically, I moved to eap ACA, uh, step one. And then um, step two, uh, or maybe at the same time, um, deploy this conservative peer pseudonym mode um, so that it makes it harder to get hold of the MC. And then the next step really is certificate-based approach, 
where you basically set up tunnels for um, for transport of EPSIM and EACA, well, preferably just EACA, and you transport them in an encrypted tunnel that's authenticated. Uh, so, and there are existing techniques for that. Um, there's a catchly named the EEP TTLS, uh, which plus EEP ACA, it can run on um, 802.1x and it can run inside um, the Ike auth as well. So they're, they're kind of potential solutions that are already standardized. Uh, I mean, the only catch is that they potentially can hit you with a bit more latency. You've got a few more message um, sort of round trips and things. Uh, so. Potentially people don't like them for that reason, but to be honest, if you look at the latencies for Wi-Fi based attachment, you wouldn't really think anyone's worried about it. It takes like seconds to uh, typically connect um, to an endpoint. But there are other solutions. Now, um, MC encryption. So actually, I sort of mentioned, I don't think I quite mentioned it, but I'm working on a European funded project um, called 5G Ensure. And, um, and one of the partners within the project has um, suggested uh, an MC um, encryption uh, technique, which is, is a, which is a possible way to go. Uh, but then you add you do add some other uh, complexities into the exchange. There are other older um, suggestions of protecting the MC, which maybe should be reevaluated. And then the standard body should probably. Um, get a bit stronger on trying to recommend protection of such exchange of, of uh, identities. Mobile OS mitigations, um, well, as I say, you, they need to support this um, EPACA with pseudonym support, and it's emerging in some OSs, and as I mentioned, um, Apple told me that uh, they basically introduced this feature into iOS 10 directly as a result of this work, of our work, and then there's difficult based approaches. They need to implement those into the uh, OSs. They may well have support, but they're not always so keen on um, talking about it, whether it properly works with everything. And then also it'd be nice if uh, there was a bit more user choice associated with some of these automatic Wi-Fi networks, because you might decide that you don't really want to do that kind of thing. It's, it is possible, but it's not exactly straightforward. So here we are, user mitigation. Um, so you can actually turn off the auto join for these auto Wi-Fi, but the snag is, is you've actually got to be in range of an access point. It's got to pop up in the list. You've got to hit the little I button and then go and tap the, uh, the auto join thing and switch it off. Uh, so it, it doesn't sort of make it that easy and so it doesn't let people know that that's actually happening. And then providing protection, um, this uh, conservative peer support, well, there's not actually much user intervention there, but uh, it kind of happens on the user side. Similarly, on Android, you can do the forget for auto Wi-Fi profiles, but again, it's potentially limited by um, whether you're in range or some versions of, of Android, like less the old ones. So it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Wi-Fi calling, you can just turn that off, but um, then, it's, uh, then it just doesn't work. Uh, I guess uh, you could switch off Wi-Fi in untrusted environments as well, I suppose, because you never know quite what's coming around the corner. I don't know if some of, the, some of you guys saw the, the Google Project Zero stuff where they um, found a hole in the, uh, the firmware of the uh, pretty widely used Wi-Fi chipset, and you can get sort of a remote code exploit happening through Wi-Fi. Just uh, that was that was quite interesting. So anyway, um, that's a separate thing. So we got to, got to the end summary. Um, large scale MC exposure issues really um, on on Wi-Fi, which kind of down to poor privacy mandates and the standards really. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe if they'd written it stronger, maybe the operators would have implemented a stronger solution. Maybe they figured it was just too expensive and just wait until the uh, get uh, leaned on. Uh, widespread configuration, pre-configuration stuff with no kind of opt-out kind of meant this sort of stuff happens. And also be kind of good if some of these uh, um, entities did a bit more testing in terms of leakage of things like 
particular devices like the MC and IMEI, it, it shouldn't, they shouldn't really be flying around the network. You, basically, you can just find this stuff right running Wireshark in monitor mode, get your phone to connect and, and just uh, like flag up, hey, I just saw the MC fly by, that shouldn't be happening. But um, it's, it's complicated to fix the problem. Um, so we've been chatting to some of the um, operators and vendors to try and fix the issue, but it's not just one kind of entity's problem. It's got to be fixed in the mobile device, in the vendor's kit, and then the operators have got to say, right, let's switch it on and enable it for everyone. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Future work, well, we're looking at potential detection techniques, but that's not easy because... Uh, you basically could pretend to be anything you like out there on the network unless you've got some sort of cryptographic certificate. I've been looking at more uses of this, these authentication techniques and um, just poking around at SIM cards and things. So connect, continuing this work on this 5G Ensure project, which is actually running till November now, so it's been running for about a year and a half. Got a little ways to go yet. Um, so that's the lot, that's, uh, that's me. Any questions? Yeah. What's the question? Is it well, Edge Packet Data Gateway, um, because it's, um, as I showed in the, I mean, I guess we can pop back just. Um, Whoop, there we are. Uh, got this full authentication. It's um, there's a whole bunch of steps in there, obviously, but actually it's just the first two we're interested in. So again, with the Edge Packet Data Gateway, it's actually rather early on um, in the uh, connection. So uh, it's basically just um, an IPsec server configured to uh, accept connections. Um, which are compatible with the Wi-Fi calling, which essentially is just uh, doing um, an EAP um, authentication. Yeah, it just it doesn't have to be on the. I mean, you can just set it up on a private network, and uh, I, I I've run up a proof of concept code just on my laptop, just run it run it in. Uh, anywhere kind of thing. You just uh, you can set up a, a private network, have the phone connect to it, or um, I mean in, in terms of the public uh, exploitation of it if you like, uh, it, it, um, to get the phone to talk to it, it, it looks up a particular operator dependent uh, host name for the Edge Packet Data Gateway so you've got this DNS name, send it to the DNS. You can either subvert the DNS and give it like your own kind of malicious, uh, you, you kind of bad guy IP, and that runs the IPsec server. Or you can just do an IP redirect and redirect the packets um, to whatever IP has been looked up on the DNS and, um, and have the phone converse with that. So really just, you just got to get the phone to talk to your... Uh, to the sort of the malicious um, edge packet data gateway entity, which essentially is just a, an IPsec server, and then then you're done. Yeah, then it's it's pretty hard to detect because you can just pretend to be any kind of IPsec server you like. Just configure the the thing up, and it'll say it's a whatever Cisco one or. A, Whoever, whoever it is kind of runs up. I and mean, there's not always that much information anyway in terms of the initial exchanges. They don't kind of advertise exactly who it is and who's running it and everything. There's pretty minimal stuff in these um, initial exchanges. Hi. It's, it's a sort of temporary... It's it's different from the um, fast reauthentication one. The fast reauthentication, I didn't go into too many details about it, but basically it has to be changed for every um, interaction. Um, so you can only you you can only use it once, uh, and then you have to get a new one. Um, uh, 
But with the pseudonym, it's it's been it's handed out by the network to your device, and it has a lifetime. Um, so maybe um, hours or days, typically. Um, and so the device would keep that on, store it in sort of non-volatile kind of storage, so it could then reuse it to uh, connect to the network. And so it then, so when it was asked to do a full authentication, it would then use the pseudonym identity as opposed to the MC. Uh, so it would just be harder to track. You'd have to, well, depending, typically what, I think they could potentially exchange the pseudonym identity uh, encrypted. Um, so you you can't necessarily observe it being exchanged with the end device. So uh, it makes it harder to track devices that way. And it's that's that's the kind of that's the easiest sort of next step. That's because we uh, I didn't mention it, but we talked we gave a talk to the GSMA, uh, which is the which is a, um, an association of the operators, of like 800 operators. Uh, so basically, kind of global. And we gave them a talk about this stuff before we went public with it. And their answer is basically pseudonym support is sort of step one. Step two is the certificate-based stuff. But that takes a bit more effort because you've got to deploy all the certificates into the network on the devices. And then you've got to maybe potentially have like special certificate store on the device. Um, more complicated, but potentially more secure, hopefully. But Okay. Right. Well, um, thanks, and uh, see you around. Give me a shout if you.